Oh, here's some puzzling observations. This is part of our current research. Here's a building in Indianapolis. We have two glass units side by side. One exhibited physical damage in the form of scratches, the other one didn't. And you would think in a location like that side by side that the nature of the dirt on both of those would be the same. So what's in play here? Why does this happen? We call this the drag effect. We've discovered, maybe some of you have noticed this, some glass surfaces, when you clean and your cleaning solution has nearly evaporated the dryness, it's, the surface is not silky smooth. There's a drag. You can notice it with a squeegee. Then I come up with this clever little test by accident using a microfiber cloth. And sometimes when I used to do touchy-feely with my hand, I swear the glass was going to rip some of my skin away. And sometimes that characteristic is fleeting. You could go back two minutes later and do the same thing and not notice it. These are some of those strange glass surface behaviors that we're investigating now. There's something behind it. What it is, we're not entirely sure, but it may help in the approach for non-conventional glass cleaning to learn more about this so that the techniques for cleaning glass that's challenged were greatly improved. Here's what's underway with Professor Song Kim's group at Penn State. In no sense of reality, he's just going to develop instrumentation to look for microtexture features on a glass surface that give rise to this drag effect. Once he can do that, and his intention is to quantify those entities which contribute to the drag effect, how does this affect cleaning of the glass? Does it affect glass cleaning? How can you overcome challenges in the field when you learn more about the species and the characteristics that are in play? Here's something that defies expectations. I don't like to read slides, but we'll read this one. This is from Professor Kim's group. When a soda lime glass surface is rubbed with a bearing grade stainless steel, we're talking about ball bearing grade stainless steel, in his wear test, the wear occurs mostly on the stainless steel ball and not the glass. Does that defy your expectations? If I told you we were going to do this rub-a-dub test with a steel bearing on a glass surface, and I told you that the findings were that the, that the steel ball wore more than the glass did, you'd say I'm crazy. That's why I put the authors of this paper. I didn't do it. Professor Pantano, Professor Kim, and some of their associates published the paper, and I have the paper with me where these were the results. What does this tell us? There just may be a lot of glass that we don't know. Unexplored behaviors, the role of humidity in the instance of mechanical contact with glass. How much of a role does that play? How do we learn more and more about these situations to, again, enhance those techniques which will approach those non-conventional situations? And they point out here, there's need for more research to elucidate these, these issues. There's a lot of unanswered questions. And I like to point out, when you make an observation which is different, you talk about what it might mean in hypothetical terms. Some people don't do that. They'll find something new, and they'll get excited, and they'll speak in terms of conclusions. I don't do that. Neither does Paul West. Neither does Professor Kim. It's hypothetical. We want to go back and repeat and repeat and verify the observations made before conclusions are drawn. So this is a process. And we hope to publish and disseminate information as the process continues as we learn more. What are some of the strange things about glass surface behavior that have been heretofore unexplored? But even though they've been unexplored, that from time to time, these features or characteristics come into play on a cleaning job. So there's nothing to lose by investigating that which hasn't been articulated in the past. Past achievements, in conclusion, we've discussed that. We've, collaboration has resulted in two important documents. Communication links remain in place. That's important for the future. Future opportunities. Based on what we've seen with how well the teachings of those two important documents have been transmitted to the world of glass installation and glass cleaning. 
there needs to be a concerted effort to convey the importance of those documents and what they teach. We need to reach more people. And we also need to develop enough momentum to convince general contractors that allowing glass to be challenged, literally the day that's installed in the building, that that's unacceptable. And I think we're going to have to enlist the aid of the architects because they can write up the contracts and specs that can put the heat on the GCs. Because for too long, the assumption's been conventional wisdom, you need a diamond to scratch glass. So let's let mortar, weld splatter, tailings from grinding operations, everything. Let that make contact with a glass surface. Who cares? A window cleaner is going to come in and magically clean the glass at the going rate, dirt cheap, as though nothing was on the glass. And that's the expectation. That has to change. Again, expand the educational programs. How do we do that? The links, I think, will be main maintained between IWCA and the new NGA or association. And then the Glass Committee welcomes you to join us in our research efforts. Because I don't think there are many glass fabricators that on their own would choose to initiate research projects of this nature. We're very fortunate with Penn State that Professor Kim's group, he takes donations from the IWCA Glass Committee. Their, I would say, their unrestricted donations, meaning he's not forced to investigate anything we tell him to investigate. But let me tell you this, Professor Kim and now retired Professor Pantano they have an interest in the problems we face. They have an interest in how glass surface behavior and chemistry impacts the real world of glass installations and glass cleaning. So for a few dollars, what IWC is able to achieve, Professor Kim does the research work, focuses on areas where we have an interest, and we're able to move forward and learn a lot of things we've never learned before. And in fact, in Boston, 15, okay, He's going to present a paper based on some of the work that has been initiated from uh, some of the problems we presented. I think Paul West is going to be in town from Hawaii for that. And Professor Kim asked me to, to articulate problems encountered at job sites that he wants to work into his presentation. And another thing to point out some of the progress being made, Professor Kim is in the process of writing a proposal to the National Science Foundation and I've been out of proposals for too many years. I suspect today it's for hundreds of thousands of dollars. In his proposal, he mentioned by name Paul West in the cooperation with the Glass Committee and IWCA as a contributing entity to the research that he hopes to undertake. And that would include focusing on problems with glass surface behavior, how that behavior and those features impact cleaning, dirt and debris, in the entire process, the heretofore unarticulated aspects of glass surfaces. I thought that was a major achievement in itself that we now have the Materials Research Institute at Penn State interested in what we're trying to do. So that's a step forward. And just think, it started with Gregory Carney talking to Paul West. And then Ermola taking up the, the task and continuing to talk to Paul West. Oh, here's one. This is where you can help me, please. We're in need of tempered glass samples from various and sundry sources. Something on the order of 4 inches by 16 inches or 6 by 18s. There's some very interesting features of glass surfaces that we've uncovered. Not ready to go through all of that today. But the more samples we have, the more we can determine are those things that were observed just a flash in the pan or something that's reproducible and something common to certain glass surfaces. Tin surface versus air surface, the amount of tin in the glass, was sulfur dioxide used in a tempering or heat strengthening process or not. All these can affect the glass surface chemistry and some of these subtle things about glass are what we hope to uncover in our research program. One final consideration. How many of you have ever been asked about this situation? Anybody say yes? yes. 
<laughs> we, myself, Paul West, and the folks I talked to at IWC, we call it a condensation ghost. I do know a fellow called me whose family owns a glass fabrication operation in Western PA. He had condensation goats on, ghosts on a job in Ohio. He says, what is it? I told him, I told him what could be done. The life history of the glass is revealed by condensation. In some piece of literature I read, it explained this in terms of, well, there's a residue on the glass. Well, if you let that stand, you have a problem because now you as a supplier are accused of having glass go out into the field with a residue. There may have been this place, a handling cup, a suction cup, made contact with the glass at one time. Maybe there was a residue. What happens is glass is literally alive from a chemistry point of view. You can have preferential aging of the glass. You can have it, you have it all the time, I should say. The area where the cup made contact ages differently from the adjacent areas. Whatever minute residue was there from the cup can be totally washed away. But the chemistry signature, the chemical signature is still there. So again, there's a point, a teaching point here. Don't let people tell you if they see a condensation ghost that you supplied bad glass. And don't buy into the literature which says there has to be a residue on the glass in order to create this effect. In many cases, I know this happened once. I have five minutes left. PPG salesman, he's a good guy. Some lady's new glass in the kitchen. She's cooking her steam everywhere. She's a suction cup mark. Oh my goodness. Something wrong with my glass. Salesman shows up. Yeah, you're right, there's something wrong with your glass. Lesson number two, carefully and diplomatic talk around, the customer's always right, but diplomatically point out how they are correct, but maybe not entirely correct. I'll get back to you with a real answer in a couple of weeks or a couple of days. Don't necessarily agree and jump on a bandwidth. Yeah, you're right, there's something wrong. But that's what the PPG sells when they just something wrong with the glass. I don't know what they did. They probably replaced it, but that was it shouldn't be happening. The point is, it's time to join together and avoid needless frustration. And also there's this invitation extended. The annual convention and trade show in San Diego next month. All are welcome. Any questions? Yes, sir. Absolutely, and that's why that, that document on cleaning where it says non-conventional, it's impossible to go in there under normal circumstances with conventional techniques and clean that glass and not expect there to be an immense risk to surface damage. And more and more people need to walk away from the situation. That lady with that building in Western PA, she walked away from it. She thought up front it was going to be easy money. What about the easy money if she got sued? I know of a situation I mentioned to several people here. I know of a fellow, I don't think he's an IWCA member, otherwise maybe he would have learned better over time. He's accused, by way of his brother, of doing $200,000 in damage to a single home near Cleveland. And what he did was just, he responded in the absolute wrong fashion to a situation he should have walked away. But he caved in to the general contractor, oh, we gotta get this done, we gotta clean this. And he believed that. And you're right, more people need to walk away from these projects. So what do we do collectively? You have to minimize, if not eliminate, those situations where the extraordinary cleaning techniques are required. The third parties get away with murder. You know, there was a time when the glass people essentially said the window cleaners don't know how to clean windows. The window cleaner said the glass people are supplying bad glass. In the meantime, the people who compromised the windows get away scot-free. And that went on for 20 years. And I think that's changed. We've changed the corner. And again, those two men that had some vision, Paul and Gregory, and thank goodness Irma has taken up that, that mission. 
And I'm grateful to the late Jeff Harden for getting me involved, because I do this as a hobby. I find the investigations very interesting. And I enjoy it when I'm teaching and people learn something that they haven't heard before. But also I enjoy, hopefully, ending the need for people to endure frustration over something that, where I know the answer, I may know a solution. The solution may be to simply walk away. Any other questions? So hopefully we can move forward with more and more effort, more projects, and uh, someday report on some real, real progress in our educational effort. And also, if you're going to be at Glass Expo Northeast in March, stop by because I've been tagged as the man to do the AIA presentation. Thank you. Stay tuned for our next episode of AWC TV by following us on YouTube, Facebook, or our website, awcmag.com.